Right, today we are picking up again our series on the letter of James. And today we've got to chapter 3. So if you have your Bibles handy, um, we're in James chapter 3 and beginning at the first verse. Not many of you should presume to be teachers, my brothers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. If anyone is never at fault in what he says, he's a perfect man, able to keep his whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses, horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they're so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of his life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and creatures of the sea are being tamed and have been tamed by man, but no man can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil full of deadly poison. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in God's image. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. Well, you've probably got the general drift of what we're focusing on today. And the title I've been given is Words, Words, Words. We've already had a mention back in chapter one, which was the kind of introduction to the whole theme, about the need to be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. And in verse 26, we were told that if anyone considers himself religious and yet does not keep a tight rein on his tongue, he deceives himself and his religion is worthless. So it's rather a sobering prospect today. And so before we start, I'm going to show you a, a birthday present I had from my grandson, Zach. He painted this little picture for me, and he has written a verse on it from Psalm 19 and verse 14. It says, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. That's a very precious gift to me because Zach made it for me. And I'm also very touched that he thought that would be an appropriate verse for me. Because as we find at the beginning of this chapter, people who take it upon themselves to try and teach actually bear a very heavy responsibility. In fact, James goes as far as to say, don't all rush to want to be the preacher. So I'm sorry, all those of you who were desperate to preach today, sorry, the answer's no. But some of you might like to do it sometimes. Be very aware that this is actually a very heavy responsibility because we all stumble in many ways. There is not one person in this room, I don't believe, who hasn't sometimes spoken out of turn, said things you wished you could retract, but of course once the words are out of your mouth, you can't take them back. And there's not one of us who could honestly say, I have never sinned with my tongue. But does it really matter? It's only words. Hmm. But we judge people, don't we? We judge people by what they say. And if you stick yourself above the parapet, do you know what? People judge you more harshly. They hold you to a higher standard. But also we've been warned 
that actually God holds you accountable for what you say. So it's very important that we really keep a close guard on the words coming out of our mouths. So if, like me, you're a person who tends to talk a lot, I know I'm not the only one in this room, but I may be one of the prime offenders, but I know some of you have the same problem. Listen very carefully today. Words. Do they really matter? Do you remember that old saying? I used to be taught it as a child, and I'm sure lots of you have heard it. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can never hurt me. How many people know that is not true? How many of you have never ever been cut to the core by words? Or they don't produce visible bruises, like if you went with sticks and stones. But your soul can take bruises too. And sometimes the words that have gone deep inside us have done us more damage than any stone or stick. You see, words are very powerful. In fact, it was through word that God created the heavens and the earth. He spoke and it came to be. And Jesus is described as the word of God, the one who actually expresses the very thoughts that were in God's heart. We actually see expressed in Jesus all that God wanted to bring about. He was the agent of creation. Word is very, very powerful. And we're told by James earlier in his letter, verse 18 of chapter 1, he chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. In other words, the fact that those of us who have received Jesus as Lord and have been saved and born again and started a whole new life with him, that was done because it was through his word of truth that we've been set free in order that we should then be a reflection of what he meant people to be. And interestingly, it was through lies, words, spoken by the enemy, that everything got ruined. It's through Satan's lies that we find ourselves trapped and doing what he says because somehow he's convinced us that that rubbish is true. And freedom comes when we recognize the difference between truth and lies. And we stop responding to the lies that we've believed all our lives and we begin to believe and respond to the truth that God speaks into our hearts through Jesus. Now, if anybody's still not convinced that the tongue is a very important issue, James gives us two very good illustrations here. One about putting a bit in the mouth of a horse. Now, for those of you who, like me, are not horse-minded people or can't ride one, but even I know that when you put the bridle on the horse, there's a bit of metal that goes in the horse's mouth and it's attached to the reins and the rider can pull the reins and you steer the horse. And James tells us, when we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. I saw a beautiful uh, illustration of this not long ago. There was a TV program. It was all about, the yet one more, about the royal family. And somebody was talking about the day back in 1981 at Trooping the Colour, when our, our late queen was riding... Down, uh, down the Mall and Horse Guards Parade for the Trooping of the Colour on her birthday parade. In those days, she used to do it on horseback. As she got older, she had to be brought in a carriage. But back in 1981, she was still riding. And there she was, riding down the, the Mall and into Horse Guards Parade, sitting side saddle, so she can't do anything, you know, you can't do it with your knees, I don't think, if you're sitting side saddle. But she's just holding the reins with her hands. On this occasion, somebody in the crowd suddenly fired a gun six times. 
Thankfully, it was blanks. Nobody was actually hurt, although police from all sides immediately homed in and arrested the person. But they fired at the Queen as she rode by, and the horse was spooked. And when you, if you're watching the film, you can see that actually the horse suddenly sort of begins, it wants to bolt. And the Queen, who up till now has been sitting just gently steering her horse, because she was a great horsewoman, suddenly she has to tighten those reins and hold it, but do you know what? That horse didn't bolt because she pulled on the bit and the, with, and the bridle and the horse calmed down and both the queen and the horse, whose name was Burmese apparently, continued as if nothing had happened and the whole event went forward as planned. When you've got a good bit in the mouth of the horse and you have somebody riding who's in control of that, Disaster can be averted and normal life can continue a normal direction because if you can control the tongue, you can control your whole body, he says. He uses another illustration, a ship's rudder, for those of you who are into sailing. And of course, in, in um, James's day, all the ships were sailing ships. A great big thing with big sails and it catches the wind and the wind can drive it about. But sitting at the back near the tiller, the rudder, is one person who turns this small bit of wood at the back of the ship and that directs its course. Again, a small thing, but it can direct something much bigger and more powerful. So whether we're talking about taming those inner impulses and natural uh, things that you know, like with the horse's bit, or whether we're talking about dealing with the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, to quote Shakespeare, you know, the winds that may buffet us and are out of, outside of us. He says, actually, learning to control your words is a very key thing for not making a shipwreck of your life. So actually, according to James, it's pretty important that we learn to control our tongues. And in fact, we are warned by Jesus himself in Luke 6, 45, you'll find, um, that actually one day, no, sorry, I've got the, the, Luke 6, 45, it tells us, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. That's it. And then in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 36, he tells us something here. But I tell you that men will have to give account on the day of judgment for every careless word they have spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted and by your words you will be condemned. It's not just the big actions and it's not just the big sermons. You know, obviously I have to be very careful because I do a lot of talking. But actually all of us are called to account ultimately for everything we've done and everything we've said. Now that should be a sobering thought. Because, as James says here, consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body, corrupting the whole person, setting the whole course of his life on fire, and itself set on fire by hell. That's pretty scary. Now, in recent months, we've seen on our television news screens quite a lot of out-of-control fires. It's been quite an issue in various parts of the world. And you know, a forest fire can be started by somebody dropping a cigarette butt or failing to douse their bonfire. And suddenly, miles and miles of countryside and people's homes are destroyed because of fire which is out of control. And James says the tongue's like that too. Its impact goes way beyond and it's and its potential for causing trouble is almost limitless. It can do huge damage. And we're back to that bit about, you know, the sticks and stones that break my bones. But no, 
Some people have had words spoken to them, even as small children, which have marked them for life and have believed things about themselves which are not true and it has crippled them. And sometimes when we speak to somebody, we can sort of think, oh, well, that wasn't much, but actually you don't know what triggers you may be pressing, what pains you may be stirring up. We need to be very careful, as I say, to engage brain before opening mouth. You know, and this doesn't just apply to our carefully considered words. It may also apply to the ones that just come out without thinking. Or even sometimes our well-intentioned ones. In Matthew chapter 16, verses 22 to 23, we find Peter being rebuked by Jesus. Jesus has just begun to tell them about how he is going to be the savior of the world and that it isn't going to involve armies and sort of glorious victories and all that sort of thing. It's actually going to involve going to a cross. It's going to involve self-sacrifice and self-denial and apparently complete defeat. And what's more, as his followers, he's telling them, you've got to walk this way too. Now, that was not what they were expecting. And Peter instinctively says, no, we'll never let that happen to you. And Jesus says to him, get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me. You're trying to make me stumble. What was that we read? We all stumble in many ways. And Satan would love us to stumble. And here's Peter actually trying to say to Jesus, no, I don't want this to happen to you. I love you. I'm going to be faithful to you. We won't let anyone do that to you. And he's saying, get behind me, Satan. In other words, you're rehearsing the words of the devil here. The devil who wants to turn me aside from the path my father has set for me. The devil who wants to tempt me to give way to my, my humanness and not do his will, to sort of put my thinking above his thinking. He says, you're a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. And so often when we're speaking, it's not that we're deliberately trying to sort of, you know, curse and swear at people. It may simply be that our minds are so full of the things that occupy the minds of men and the goals and the aims and the ambitions of men that actually we might sometimes find that we are speaking the very words that Satan would speak to somebody, pressing their vulnerable bits, tempting them to turn aside from his ways and do it their way, perhaps offering them what Satan would offer, you know, world on a plate, Jesus, if you'll just worship me. And sometimes we could be the agents of that. So again, be aware, the potential for evil with an uncontrolled tongue is huge. And the problem is that bit in Luke 6, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. What comes out of our mouth is an indication of what is inside in the heart. And unless you have a totally purified, finished, sanctified heart, you're going to need to keep a bridle on that tongue. Because as, um, as James says here, if anybody is never at fault in what he says, well, that's an indication that he's just about a finished work because there's nothing inside that could come out and be dishonoring to God. Because, you, well... You do know, don't you, that if you, whatever pressure you put on somebody, nothing will come out that isn't in there. So if out of your mouth comes lies, cursing, slander, unpleasantness, bitchiness, gossip, and all the rest of it, if that comes out, it's because that's the sort of stuff that's going on somewhere in your heart. And oops, in an unguarded moment, out it came. Or maybe sometimes I wasn't even unguarded. I was actually about to indulge myself. We're going back to the beginning of, of James' letter in a moment. What can we do? All kinds of animals, birds, etc., can be tamed by man, but no man can tame the tongue. I can't do it. It happens. I don't want to speak like that, but I do. 
I try to stop myself, but sometimes I think, oh, I wish I could bite my tongue off after the words have come out. What can we do? He says, no man can tame the tongue. But remember what Jesus said, what is impossible with men is possible with God. God has placed within us his Holy Spirit. He is able to do what we can't do. We have actually a bit of a battle going on inside. Paul talks about this in, um, in Romans chapter 7. You know, sometimes I do the things I don't want to do, and the things I don't want to do, I do. There's a battle going on inside me. And you'll see it very clearly in the words that are coming out of the mouth. What can we do, he says? Actually, he says, remember, we don't have to live according to the promptings of our flesh. We can live by the Spirit. These two are at war with each other. Now, just to explain, the word flesh doesn't mean there's something wrong with your body. Flesh just means what I am, just by nature. And of course, flesh is fallen. Flesh is, is impacted by evil at every point. And so when I'm just doing what comes naturally, whether I'm behaving well or badly, I'm just doing what comes naturally. There's nothing miraculous about that. But when we are born again of the Spirit of God and the Holy Spirit dwells in us, we can actually choose to be governed by him. Again, we've got a different rider now. Going back to that picture of the queen riding her horse, Burmese, she was in total control while the horse was behaving. And the minute the horse was spooked by the gunman and nearly went, she was in control and stopped him. If he'd had a different rider, it might have been a different outcome. So think of ourselves like this. When the Holy Spirit is the rider and, and it is him who is governing us, we can control our tongues if we choose to, if we want to. That's the key thing. What do I want to do? And sometimes in that brief moment, what I want to do is vent my fury or let out my frustration. Or maybe if you're really sort of got a wicked heart, you want to deceive somebody for your own ends. You want to con them. I hope we haven't got anybody here like that today, but let's face it, you've all had those phone calls by people who want to empty your bank accounts and they come with all these persuasive words. And the power to tame our tongues is not in our strength or our wisdom, but in yielding to the Holy Spirit rather than to what we would naturally do. And that is a choice we can make. We can choose to use our tongues well. See what, um, what James says a bit further on. Oh, sorry, I've missed something. I want to go back just to chapter 1 and verse 19 again, when he says that bit. Take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak slow to become angry for man's anger does not bring about God's righteousness or the righteous life that God desires here. You can see the progression, can't you? We need to learn, first of all, to zip the lip, to keep quiet, to listen, so that we're not just going off half-cocked, as it were, we're not just responding to the trigger, we're thinking before we speak. That's why that bit about, you know, the meditation of my heart is so important. Because if, my, if the meditation of my heart has been checked, then what comes out should be reflecting that. So he says, be quick to listen, hear the other side, take on board, think about what you're saying. Slow to speak. So it doesn't just come blurting out before I've even had a chance to think. What, um, what David says in Psalm 141, set a guard over my mouth, O Lord. Keep watch over the door of my lips. And then if we're doing that, we are slower 
to become angry. And of course, anger can very easily lead us into sin. We move on in James now to um, verse 9, where he talks about if your tongue is not controlled, your life will be inconsistent. With the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse men who have been made in God's image. So that shouldn't be. That is not consistent. You cannot one minute be singing praises to God and the next minute criticizing, slandering, judging, shouting at somebody else and that be somehow consistent. Now, one is motivated by the spirit, one is definitely motivated by the flesh and don't make excuses for the flesh. We need to crucify it. We need to stop, think, weigh it, and that is a choice you can make, but you have to choose. He will give you the strength to do what the Spirit leads you to do. We have to choose. He does not force us. And so actually, learning to keep quiet for a bit, to think before we speak, is also how we prevent that flame of anger setting off a forest fire. So the first thing about making the choice is actually to acknowledge that that isn't right. What James says there, you know, brothers, this should not be. This is not consistent. You can't have a fresh spring and a salt spring producing the same water. You can't have a fig tree producing olives and you can't have a, a, a grapevine bearing figs. You know, Whatever the tree is, that's what it'll produce. And that's what comes out of your mouth. Whatever is in there is coming out. So the first thing is to acknowledge and confess when we're wrong. When those words have come out, we need to be very quick to apologize. We need to be very quick to try and put right the damage we've done. And we need to be very quick to ask God to forgive me and please put a better door over my lips, Lord. But the next bit is very important. Don't stop there and keep focusing on what I mustn't do. How many of you know that if there's one thing that makes it really hard to resist temptation, it's when you're saying, I mustn't do this, I mustn't do this, I mustn't do this, and what's in your mind? Oh, the thing I want to do. You know, if I'm walking past the donuts and I'm sort of thinking, no, I mustn't have one of those, I don't want to get fat, I don't want to, don't want to eat that, it's, it's not healthy, it won't be good. But if all I'm thinking about is those donuts and how I mustn't eat one, I mustn't eat one, I mustn't... Well, you know what? A lot better if you kind of put the donuts out of sight and start focusing on the stuff that's good. And the same principle goes when it comes to this business about taming our tongue. We can't do it in our own strength. So the first thing we need is to acknowledge that and we need forgiveness. But then we need to change our focus. And don't focus on what we're not to say. I mustn't swear, I mustn't curse, I mustn't lie, I mustn't, you know, pass judgment on my brother. Don't focus on not saying things, but choose to speak in a way that will bless and build up others. Doesn't mean not challenging. Sometimes the way you build somebody up is actually by challenging them, but in a loving and godly way, not with a load of cursing and swearing. If we choose to think, what can I say that will bless somebody? How can I encourage that person? How can I comfort them? How can I build them up? How can I help them to grow in their faith? If that's our whole focus, as you choose that, you'll begin to find that those are the things your heart is beginning to focus on. And the more your heart begins to focus on those, the more it'll come out in your mouth, and gradually you'll find you're getting in control. So the starting point is with the choice. It's the relying on his strength and it's actually choosing to walk his way and to speak his way. In other words, as um, James says here, go back to the source. Become what you are. Any man who is in Christ is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. It's all there. You just have to give expression to that. And when it comes to how you speak to other people, you know, when you, um, when you curse or criticize or judge somebody else, you're doing that to somebody who's made in God's image. 
Learn to respect the image of God in other people. Even if they're not a very perfect expression of it sometimes, well, nor am I. But learn to respect that. That is a person who's made in God's image. I need to be building them up, not tearing them down. And if you've got a sweet water spring, outflows sweet water. Don't let it be contaminated by a spring of salty water because, you know, the salty water doesn't become sweet. It's the sweet water becomes salty. The corrupt spring actually corrupts the good spring. So actually we need to think, I'm looking to let Jesus be in control of everything that's coming out from me. Let him deal with the heart and what comes out of the mouth will be sorted. Because basically, a loving heart will produce loving speech. A bitter heart will produce bitter speech. And we'll be focusing all the time on other people's faults and how they've hurt me. And self-pity will be sort of making me feel like I'm justified in doing that. But no, out of the overflow of my heart, let it be the spring of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, he who believes in me, out of his heart, out of his innermost being, will flow springs of living water. And this he said about the Holy Spirit who was going to be given to those who believed in him. So let me come back to the picture that my grandson drew for me, or well, painted for me, sorry. That was my 70th birthday present from Zach. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and redeemer. In other words, just remember, every word we speak, he hears. And according to Jesus himself, one day we will be called to account for every word we speak, even every careless word. So if you remember that he's listening, how many of you know that sometimes people's speech changes according to who's listening? Tell you what, if, it's one of the things, yeah, if, if you're a preacher or you're known to be a, a clergyman of some description, do you know, some people will curb their language when you're around, not because you've told them to, they just do, or they'll go, oh, sorry, vicar, <laughs> that, that sort of thing. If you remember that Jesus is there, what difference would it make to how much control you keep over your tongue? And how much more quickly would we become those perfect people who by controlling their words, learn to control their whole life and behavior?